it's gone this bad. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to The Reason We Learn. I'm your Hello. host. Hello. I don't have any, uh, I can't seem to get my headphones working here yet. Hold on a second. We can hear you. <laughs> Paul, there can, we you go. Hear us? can you hear now us? Now I can. Can you hear me? And now we hear yeah. echo. We hear you twice. Echo, echo. Okay, hold on a second. Okay, we can hear you. All right, we're all good. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> um, so welcome to The Reason We Learn. I'm your host, Deb Philman, and I am joined today by Amy Gonzalez and Andrea Gross and Paul Rossi, our special guest, Paul Rossi, who's been on the channel before. So Amy and Andrea are, as I put in the description, they're canaries in the coal mine for parents who've been labeled physical threats. You probably heard even some of you public school parents like domestic terrorists. Um, they are representing, though, the private school perspective. We talk a lot about public school and a lot of people are under the impression that private school doesn't have this going on because, you know, the parents pay and they're consumers and all this. And, and uh, Amy and Andrea are here to dispel some myths. Um, and Paul, who's done significant research into this topic, is going to help us. So what happened with them is, and they'll tell their story in more detail, but their headmaster alerted the FBI in April of 2021. 20, and so they're coming here to, you know, about their complaints and concerns. And they're coming here to discuss what happened when they asked Columbus Academy, which is an NIAS school. That's the National Association of Independent Schools. What are you teaching our children? Their innocent children were expelled in retaliation against their parents. So, you know, again, you know, they should be responsive. Really? Their kids were expelled. So a race-based curriculum was easier to force on these private schools than even in the public schools. So whether public or private, parents have to stand up and speak out for the children. Because There will, may be consequences, but it has to be done. And so they are here to talk to us and share their story. And I cannot thank you enough for being here because I know this has been a very trying time for you. So welcome. Thank you. Thank Thanks you for so having much. us. You're so welcome. So where should we, where should we start? Do you guys want to give us the the background of like when you first noticed, what you did first, second, what happened? Sure. Um, well, basically, um, Amy um, was very, very involved in the school in terms of volunteering, um, as was I. My husband had been a part of Columbus Academy for over 40 years. Um, you know, we were, it's just one of the loves of his life. Um, it's just, I think, a school that he feels like um, gave him a lot of stability at a time when he really needed it. Um, and I think it's what he feels like really made him um, a man and um, a, a critical thinker and, you know, somebody who feels like someone that needs to, you know, be a good member of the community, um, all those things. But um, so basically, you know, we were all in. Um, we had all been volunteering in various ways. My husband served on the board for six years. Um, and so what we started to notice was that um, when our headmaster came to the school in 2013, um, the, we began, we started to now be accredited by the National Association of Independent Schools. And I would say Amy and I would agree, even at that time, we really didn't know what that meant at all. We had no idea what that meant in terms of what that was going to mean as an overhaul of our entire school and um, the mission statement, the contract, the motto, um, really everything about the school changed over those eight years, kind of slowly um, in the beginning, um, but then more severely, I would say in the past two years. And so we started to see where our director of diversity and community life was referring to our community as 110 years of white supremacy. Um, they were separating our faculty and our students by the color of their skin. Ibram Kendi was being taught at professional faculty. Um, with they have no choice over what they get to be taught. Um, so these are the questions we were asking. Also basic questions about how do you get on our board of trustees? Um, we were being told over and over again at various levels that we were going to throughout the school that, um, you know, basically people would go in, we would find out other, other, other parents ask about various things and um, they would be told either you're the only one that feels that way um, or they would be given the, okay, yes. And, um, and then basically it would just be brushed to the side and nothing would be done. Right. So it's like it's your children's perception or it's your perception. Um, nothing. Um, so basically so your kids were coming home and saying this was happening or did you lots of kids? I mean, my daughter was in the upper school, so oh, okay. I think she noticed it. Those students, I think, are more aware of what's happening to them versus able to when, articulate yeah, when you're younger. But there was a um, 
a supposed um, celebration of Martin Luther King, which was not that at all. Um, it was a very, um, they said it was organically like created by the students, which it was not. It was scripted um, by the school. It was organized by the school. And at that point, um, students were yelling at each other, you're a racist. Um, you're a racist because you didn't get to the gym fast enough. Um, they were having like the, I mean, it was just, it was chanting Malcolm X. Um, so black power. Black, black power, it was not a celebration of Martin Luther King. Um, not, Martin Luther King and Malcolm X are not the same at all. And that's the problem is that our kids don't understand the difference anymore. So when that happened, a lot of parents were upset. And that's when Amy and I had already been, to be honest with you, um, noticing and um, really figuring out a lot of these things. But that's when we ultimately realized there is a very large um, conglomerate of people at our school that we have weren't the same only concerns. ones. So um, that's when we decided that we would um, write, we, we won't decided to write an open letter and an appendix. I am an attorney by background. So um, I just know that I needed to, we needed to have it very specific. It needed to not be any kind of loose allegations that had to be things that we knew were factual, provable, actual. Um, so we, we spent and were very mat meticulous about making sure that that was mm -hmm. accurate. Um, and we wanted to just actually read it to our board of directors, which is 22 members. Um, knowing that that's such a large group, we were afraid that it would be disseminated throughout the school. So we did not want to email it to them. We wanted to read it to them. Sure. Um, our head of the board, Jonathan Cass, decided, uh, told us that he only speaks to other board members, so he would not speak to us. Um, we, we tried multiple different ways to get it to not only him, to see if we could speak to him. Um, we tried to also speak to the board through um, the assistant head of the school. Um, all of them told us that they don't speak to other board members. So then we asked, so that was one of our questions. Even my husband having been on the board, I couldn't tell you how you get on the board. Nobody knows. It's very opaque. Um, so that was one of our questions then. How do you get on the board then if you won't talk to any of us and you won't answer any of our questions about what is happening with the curriculum? Are you reading these books? Are you not reading these books? What is going on? Um, and so at that point, then after that, um, we had to email it to the board because they would not talk to us. And then the board then decided to leak the documents to certain portions of the appendix to certain people in the building to try to sway their opinion, um, to paint us as, as they were calling us, anti-black, batshit, crazy Republicans. And, you know, we just wanted to confront concerns with good ideas. And we just didn't realize, you know, how that was, that that was going to be met with so much resistance. Right. And I want to talk about, I mean, this, God, I can't imagine how traumatic that must have been. You know, people talk about trauma. They toss that word around. But when your kids are in a situation where they're caught in the middle of it, that's got to be incredibly stressful. You know, well, that, yeah. you know, I mean, we, we, we started really. there, but I mean, we started with that. Then we ultimately had a zoom call meeting where we brought affidavits. Um, and I mean, we stayed on that campus where Amy continued to be the lower school parent. I was the 10th grade parent. I was the lacrosse, assistant lacrosse coach for five months while they were defaming us, calling the police on us, yeah. saying the FBI, alerting the FBI, telling the kids that they were bringing in bomb sniffing dogs to the campus. Um, we were just still holding our heads up and just trying to keep wow. it going while our kids are still going to school there. And I mean, <laughs> it was just like, I like, as I look back on it now, I feel like I was almost living outside my body because I can't. I, and, and, you so know, <laughs> and, and, and Walsh says you're, you guys are heroes. And I, I couldn't agree more when I think about how many parents are sort of quietly at home, you know, saying, I don't like this. Well, why don't you do something? Oh no. You know, it, it, it is heroic just to, to stick your, your neck out and do that. And I want to talk a little bit about the NIAS piece because I know Paul did a ton of research into that. Can you, um, or whoever wants to address this, but maybe, maybe Paul can take this one. Can you explain to the audience what NIS is, means, does, and you know, not that they should have known, they couldn't have known, right? But I think when people hear the word accredited, they hear that's a good thing, right? Like accredited. Um, and a lot of parents will even seek that out initially. Like, I only want to send my child to an accredited private school, whatever, or I want them to go to an NIS member school. Can you help the audience, many, most of whom don't have their kids in private school, perhaps understand what they are and what that means? 
Sure, I can, t I can try. How's, how's my audio? Is it okay? Yeah, it's good. Okay, okay good. Um, the NIAS, National Association of Independent Schools, uh, started in the early 60s, I think. But basically, it's an associate. Uh, there's a benign uh, description, and then there's a real description. So, the, so just the nuts and bolts are that it's an association of member schools, 1,900 schools, 1,600 in the United States. And they tend to include like some of the most prestigious elite private schools in the country. And uh, they offer support, data collection uh, around uh, demographics and school proficiencies and things around, uh, uh, as well as advice, conferences. Uh, and really, they, they're the center of an entire ecosystem mm -hmm. that moves through these schools where there's a revolving door with hiring. And there are DEI consultancies that are you know, word of mouth that gets around and board members. So a lot of the board members of the NIAS uh, association are also heads of school at these individual schools. So there are multiple jobs being done uh, very often by DEI consultants and who are also heads of schools in these schools. So there is a tremendous conflict of interest, hmm. which by their own documents, they say, needs to be a a concern. So they're right. in many ways they're violating their own um, their own best practices right. uh, in their messaging to the schools and in their in their packet of information. Really, there's maybe ten or twelve of these books that they give to each member school on how to handle troublesome parents, parents like Andrea and Amy, and it really is a, a divide and conquer strategy. So you're to be treated as mentally ill. Um, and they say that, you know, they say 5% of parents are, uh, <coughs> basically pathological. And if they cause too much trouble in school, you know, you need to just dismiss them, isolate them, whatever it takes. Uh, and that's certainly what they did to me as a teacher What the, the strategy is anyone who steps out of line and starts to ask too many pointed questions, uh, is going to be painted as an extremist. And they use that to scare the other parents and keep them in line. So what you experienced is, uh, you know, is not unusual. It it is happening every all over the place to varying degrees. You got a particularly, you know, horrific uh, implementation of it. But um, really, it's the ecosystem is um, national, mm -hmm. and it is completely aligned with social justice ideology, social justice. Um, critical theory, gender ideology, all of this is seen as desirable, progressive. And there's a, there's a messaging that comes from the top that's, that's particularly um, obfuscatory, I guess, if that's a word, which is that we care about the student's well-being. So the, the Donna Orem, who's the head of the NIS, mentions well-being a lot. So well-being is seen as this desirable thing. And ever, who could be against well-being? Sure. But what that is, is essentially a, a manage, managing palliative strategy for children um, to explicitly try to uh, calm the, any type of uh, conflicts within the school. So well-being is actually a good byproduct of actual learning and achievement and accomplishment and success. Sure. Those things are come out of doing well. But mm -hmm. what they're doing is they're creating the shortcut and running these places uh, like like camp, like a camp counselor, essentially. They're not, mm -hmm. if they're not focused on skills and, and, and achievement anymore. They're focused on, um, you know, basically kind of either ideologically or, or with drugs, 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 like calming the individual uh, so mm -hmm. that they don't make a fuss. And they that's that's essentially what this is about. Now, you may not know the factual answer of the, but I'm curious about your opinion, and this can go to anybody. Aside from the money associated with, I would assume there's money associated with the joining NAS, like you know, you kind of pay to, for membership, but then also and also any money to be made by people who are selling. DEI per professional development, all that. But aside from the most venal reasons. What's in it for these people? Like, are they true believers in the ideological sense? Are they are they trying to take down the private schools? Are they trying to destroy these children? Are they trying to own them? Like, what it's for for most people, 
the biggest question mark is, but why? Like, I mean, this seems so transparently bad, right? Um, if kids are if kids are calling each other racist in the hallways, if they're fighting with each other more, that's certainly the opposite of well-being. And I don't care what anybody says, even if, even if Andrea and Amy were literally you know, pathological or whatever, how does it contribute to the well-being of their children to expel them? If we care about their children, shouldn't we want to be like keeping them there and protecting them from their crazy moms? I mean, it to, to kick them out, that not only hurts those children who've done nothing wrong but be wrong, born to the wrong people, but all the other children now, the message gets out, all the other kids are now on high alert to police their parents I would imagine it's like, mom, please don't say anything. Oh my God, I'm going to get kicked out of school. Will you just please don't, don't be like their moms. And so the, the, the ideology that already I think separates kids from their parents is now there's like this scare tactic that everybody gets the message loud and clear. I got to control my parents. I got to shut my parents up. I got to make sure my parents on this talk about life at home being miserable. How is that well-being? So what's in it for them? Sorry, long question. But No, as you were sitting here, I was I was trying to re recall, and maybe, Paul, you've seen it. Um, before we address that, I just wanted to say, like, we probably might be the only one, certainly no longer, to stay on campus and have this experience play out over such a long period of time. Right. Um, now it is almost immediately. If you ask a question, your children are out. There is a mom who was in Georgia. Maybe you can recall the um, the name of the school, Paul, because it has totally slipped my mind. Her her kids were expelled from school. She sent something out on social media. Was told not to say anything further. Never mentioned the school, but still spoke out about some things that she felt. Um, you know, she disagreed with. And the day after Christmas, her kids were kicked out of the school. Um, you know, in, in Charleston at the Charleston Day School, one of the board members who also previously was a U.S. district attorney questioned some of the practices of the school. Financially. Yeah, financially, which we had some questions around. Yeah, we had financial money. questions about stuff too. <laughs> and um, again, this, your kids need to go. And he was kicked off the board. So, I mean, you know, so certainly well being for all kids is not at the forefront because there's a lot of examples like this that are going on. Differences in disciplinary, how they're handling disciplinary situations um, that do not seem to be level um, and, and fair. Um, I think money with the DEI, I mean, that is a whole business. I mean, basically the same things, money, power, um, control. But I think in our, I mean, like I can only speak to what I've seen at Columbus Academy because I was thinking the same thing. Like, what is the end game here? Like, why, why are people doing this? I don't understand. But I think that what I've seen is in our situation, our headmaster, when she came, this is her ideology. This is hundred so percent. She's a she true believer. And okay. she was placed there on purpose. And the way that the NAIS works, you can literally have one person change an entire school. Well, because it happened they, in our case. Well, it happened in our case because what they do then is the board doesn't know what's happening. I mean, they make the board so large that they don't function like a board. That is really not what they are. They are supposed to calm the waters. That is supposedly their job, according to NAIS. Well, and according to most recently, even a video by, um, you know, Myra McGovern, which is the vice president of media at NAIS, and then Jim Holbert, who works at the Jane Group. I mean, they're calling out Calm the waters. That's the so job when, of the board. So when you have a board that doesn't function like a board and they are told their only job is to have one person they are in charge of, which is the headmaster, and that headmaster comes and brings all of this stuff with them and then basically neuters the board, they run the show. So I think in our situation, it was brought by one person and you can see one person with the backing of the NAIS who placed her there. You, it can happen right before your eyes with one person. And the teachers have no power because like in our school, they don't have an HR department. They have nobody to go to. When all this was happening in our case, she literally had a meeting on Super Bowl Sunday with all the faculty and told them, including some of the things we were talking about were, 
affidavits from teachers who felt like they're, they were in a hostile work environment. She told all the faculty, they are not allowed to talk about any of these things that we, that Amy and I brought forward to anybody They had to bring it only to her. So if someone's creating the environment that makes you uncomfortable, you're now only allowed to go to them to figure out how to vet your issue. That doesn't seem to be a, a workplace where you're going to be able to really speak your truth. You have to just toe the line. And that's what they do. Paul, did you have a HR department at your school? No, um, uh, we had an office of community engagement, um, which was all about how to keep a community engaged in a particular way. In a particular uh, way, in other words, calm yeah. the waters. <laughs> uh, we had, I think we had 12 different, I, I counted them all up at the, from the board level down to the students, like 12 different diversity committees um, that were all oriented towards social justice at, you know, at the, at the high watermark when I, I mean, when I left. And uh, it's so interesting. There's so many different parts of this whole system that are making these types of things happen. Some of it is, uh, like you said, Andrew, name, like it's organizational. So this is a failure of organization and of stakeholders. So you have these people on the board that are maybe they meet once or twice a month. I don't know about your board, but they're not. They're checked out and they're kept that way on purpose. So I said it on a, on a uh, DEI consultancy um, conference, I guess, uh, where there's a, there's a very well-known and, and influential group called the Glasgow Group, uh, which is a consortium of DEI practitioners. And um, the head of it, Rodney Glasgow, is also a headmaster at, San, at a school in, in Maryland. So, you know, he's got double duty. So, um, but what they were saying is they were very explicit, like, you know, we need to keep the board in its lane. So these are outside consultants that are arrogating into themselves the power to, because they're brought in uh, to essentially give moral uh, security to the school. Mm -hmm. And so they have this tremendous leverage and they actually can say, you know, the board has to stay at the 50,000 foot view. They really shouldn't be engaged in the operational, you know, that's up to, I mean, that's what, that's our job. That's what we do. We come in and like, we exactly. make sure that we are, you know, giving, uh, you know, the, the interventions that are necessary so that the school can align with the best practices and around equity and inclusion and so on. So imagine, I can't imagine any other industry where the consultant has so much power, um, you know, to come in and such a, such a sense of their own, they get to set their, in, in many ways, their own agenda about what to do. And they'll say, you know, listen, if, if they don't want to implement what we want to do, but we just say, you know, you don't care about diversity. And then they cave because they really know that the demographics are changing and they have to do what we say or else they're going to get this black mark that they're not diverse enough. They're not inclusive enough. They're going to get a reputation. So it's really kind of like a mafia situation because who's going to who's going to go to the other schools and say, oh, this place is bad. It's not diverse. Enough. Yeah, it sounds like a, a protection racket. It is. And they'll do that with the kids, too. So for another example from this meeting I sit in on uh, another practitioner, John Gentile. Uh, you know, was saying, you know, I tell parents, this is my strategy for how to get parents on board. I tell you, parents, listen, this is like technology. These DEI ideas that we are experts in are like technology. So, you know, you wouldn't, we use iPads and computers today. You wouldn't expect us to use pencils, right? So we're telling your kids really important technical stuff that they need to know so that when they get to college, they don't say the wrong thing and get kicked out. So that, you know, this is a strategy. So it's like, that's a nice kid you got there. It'd be a shame if something happened to them. Why don't you let us, you know, tell you what they need so that they don't get kicked out. So that really it's this, it's, uh, it's extremely. The parents tricky. are too simple minded yeah. to understand. And the parents that speak out, for example, undercover mothers really highlighted, uh, that the Lovett School, you know, they had an insubordinate list of the parents that weren't on board, you know, um, allegedly. I mean, I guess the school investigated themselves and said that the list wasn't created. It was a farce. But um, I mean, I do believe that's, you know, then you're one of the five percenters, like Paul mentioned earlier. Well, well, on that list, you mentioned, you know, it's, you know, everyone that 
that they spoke to on the list were like, yeah, I know why I'm on that list. I might have said that one thing one time. I might have criticized them. So even though they claim that it's not authentic, of course, the person that did the investigation is connected to the board. Uh, so it's it's really there's and of course, they're not transparent about how they conducted it. So right, it's yeah. really right. there's a lot of questions around. So that. the the irony here is that the the people running around uh, people politicians not sure they're people but anyway so the politicians running around right now selling parents on the idea of for example vouchers and they're saying you need to just get your kids into a private school or pull them out and you know give you vouchers vote for us we'll give you vouchers you can go to private school they're selling you a bill of goods because the irony is you have fewer protections if that's even possible than you do in the public in the public school you've got your FOIA requests that are by law they've got to divulge certain information they can try to hide it they can't you've got school boards that as ineffectual as they may be as biased as they may be they have to be recorded they have to be out in the open um you know if you go and you speak to them that's you know, that's recorded in public comment. So, you know, there is a record that this happened. So they can't say you said X, Y, Z when you didn't really say it. Um, there's just, you know, I don't know that I would, we all now at this point, two years in realize those don't really offer a lot of protection, but now imagine don't even having that or not having like, you don't have that at all. You're on your own. It's all secret. It's behind closed doors. And, you know, like you said, Paul, it's got this like mob mentality almost where, People who aren't even literally connected to the school have more power than the people who are and who are stakeholders in the school to the point where the only way you can envision anything ch happening is mass mutiny. I mean, literally like, you know, two thirds of the parents showing up in a mob, <laughs> right? You know, like, or pulling their kids out simultaneously. But let's talk now, speaking to that, let's talk about your enrollment contracts, because the other thing that people bring up is, well, they pay. So don't they have, don't they have to respond to the people who pay? What I don't think people understand is what happens when you sign on the dotted line that I will enroll my child and pay that you're signing away a whole lot, aren't you? Yes. I mean, I think before this all started, I had, and I mean, I maybe ignorantly, obviously have been sending my child to a private school since she was four. I had no idea they had no first amendment rights to free speech in private school. Students do not have that right. Nor parents. Nor parents, apparently. <laughs> and again, these contracts, I mean, you know, they're all being overhauled. Um, you know, there's this politeness um, aspect to all of them. And allegedly is the reason that all these kids are now getting kicked out, which is the reason that our kids got kicked out is because Amy and I broke the politeness contract. But we would argue that the school breaks the politeness contract way before that when they're sending out all these things to defund the police and the side effects of white women. And I mean, you know, and it's also always at the sole discretion of, of the, head the headmaster. Master. So, you know, again, if they don't like, like what you're saying, then they deem that it's uh, you're no longer able to have collaborative or productive conversations. Because, again, welcome to the plantation, guys. Headmaster. <laughs> yeah, I know. Right. Um, that's sick. I mean, but that's how they have more control, because if you if the NAIS really can say like to one person, you control all these things via the headmaster, you know, it's easy to get your, your, whatever you want done, done. And um, so that's what happens, but these contracts are now all being rewritten to the point where there's, there's comments and there are sections of these contracts where they state, even if you win the lawsuit against the school, you still have to pay the school's attorney's fees or the standard by which they can judge whether or not what you're doing, it can be, un their judgments can be unreasonable and that's still okay via the contract that you can get kicked out. I mean, the contracts are unconscionable. They're, they're so It's hard to believe they're illegal. I don't, because because I think we need a challenge. Believe. Yeah, I think. Or, ordinarily judges, uh, it's been my experience, the judges don't particularly like it when people have been asked to sign their rights away because that's effectively what you've done. Mm -hmm. Even in a private contract, you're, you're not supposed to. And, you know, so, cause I know there'll be people in the audience going, well, why would you sign it? And it's like, again, to your point, you know, you, you have a 40 year relationship with the school, you go in in good faith. You don't maybe even don't even read the fine print because everything's been so great for so long that you've had no reason to doubt it. You've had no reason to think there's a problem. If your child starts at four years of age and you well, know, they're and going for a hundred years, the school 
the school had this stellar reputation and you never dreamed that a school was going to enforce the fact that you don't have freedom of speech. I mean, it's supposed right. to encourage those, you know. Exactly. So, but typically, you know, I would love to see those contracts challenged because like I said, I, I haven't seen too many judges in, in at least my limited legal ex you know, experience saying, yeah, it's perfectly fine for somebody to, you know, and in this case, I would say it's coercive in the sense that once your child's enrolled, which your children all were at younger ages, you're re-signing that enrollment contract each year, aren't you? Yes, Pretty much yeah. each year new to like, you know, yes, we're coming back, right? Yes. And okay. when you put the contract, they put the contracts online now. And then as soon as the new contract comes up, the old one, it, it replaces. They don't, at least at our school, it didn't stay on there. So you couldn't have a side-by-side -side comparison to see like, oh, well, we added this whole paragraph in that now, you know, with this wording. that Or the even changed one word. I mean, yeah. one word can make a big difference in a legal sentence. I mean, I think another thing that, you know, is happening with the situation, Deb, you were saying like, okay, well, ju judges don't really like one-sided contracts and they don't, but there's also this unfortunate legal ideology out there when it comes to private schools that there has been, I think, interpretation of the law that, a, that at a private school, the school can anything do anything they want. They can do anything they want. It doesn't matter. So that- Meanwhile, they want to regulate homeschool. That is I mean, hilarious. Exactly. So that's kind of in direct conflict with trying to like, you know, look at a contract that's one-sided it's it's it is one-sided but then there's also this set of law that says in private schools the school has the rights to do whatever i mean we've li literally had attorneys tell us i mean that they don't give a that i've i've had i had an attorney tell me that it doesn't matter what the board does if they're misappropriating money if they're doing this or that he told me they can literally burn the money in the backyard and there's nothing you can do about it and i'm like but yet they have a 501c3 status which you know, does have things, um, you know, minimal requirements right. in order to keep the status. And um, so I would beg to argue with that's what I said. I said, well, then why is there so whole section of 501c3 in the tax code then if they can just do whatever they, they want? want. Um, we've also had teach, uh, we've also had lawyers tell us when we've brought this up, excuse my French, but they don't give a shit about kids. And I said, well, if not, well, that then seems obvious. At this point. Right. Yeah. And it's like, well, then are you a taxpayer? Do you care about where your tax dollars go? Because private and public schools are just another way to try to divide parents. And it needs to be a, a larger umbrella of team parent because our school, although they sit on a hundred million dollar endowment, they took in the last three years on record, almost 1.5 million each of the last three years of state funds. And a lot of these not schools, for busing. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of these NAIS schools now are also receiving federal funds from mm -hmm. different, you know, funding things. So, you know, that opens up. I'm starting world. to see it now that the NIAS is the Trojan horse for the government to, you know, quietly, silently get into the private schools. And I don't just mean in terms of, you know, get government money in there to do what they want, but also to get these policies that would be consistent with very one-sided, you know, statism, basically, where the state is just going to control it. Not only that, you just mentioned a hundred million dollar endowment. That's a giant pot of money multiplied times 1600. And some endowments are even bigger than that. Oh my goodness. So, so that one's small. Million. Right. So you've got like, if, if you're the DEI people and the NIAS and you sit in a room somewhere and you go, you know, guys, <laughs> there's probably like a billion dollars or more, you know, like out there that we can just quite literally turn to our own service if we want and let the kids be damned. The kids are just, the kids are just like cogs in the machine. They just, they need to show up. Their parents need to show up and keep paying. And there will always be that percentage of parents that will pay for the name thinking and, like, well, that's for the that college money as a weapon, because that's what they use to intimidate the parents because they sit on these big endowments and they will intimidate you saying, I mean, word on the street it, was, we're, we're going to bury you. I mean, that's what the word on the street is that the Columbus Academy is going to try to do to us. Well, and if you're not getting your tuition back anyway, they're like, we'll expel you and they keep your tuition. Exactly. So it's not even like you could say, I'm taking my money and I'm going to walk. You're not. You're leaving your money on the table. So you're not only leaving your tax money for the public school you're not using, but you're leaving the private school money that you did spend. Um, and on the table. So the incentive to try to fix it, try to make it work, try to deal with it, 
plus your kids going, please don't get me kicked out of school. Please keep your mouth shut, mom. It's, it is a world of difference, in my opinion, worse than the public school situation. At least you can well, publicly complain about the public school. Right. And At like, for example, I think undercover mothers had highlighted Spence. I, I think they said on over $300 million endowment at Spence and the head of their board, I can't remember, but he is, I think a very, um, some hedge fund. Person. Yeah. Like somebody, you know, in the financial arena. So you would think that they could manage that a school, a small school of girls would be something that is manageable yet they're with this large endowment they're still running the budget and and telling the parents hey you're, we're 15 we're at a deficit, we're at a deficit of 15,000 um and you know when you really really do follow the money and the math it, it doesn't really add up so I don't know. There's a lot of questions. Everything you look at, it just begs to have more questions to be asked. Right. I mean, the, you know, the sort of the, the, the cynic in me says, you know, it's mostly about money and power, but then there's the side where you talk about your headmaster being a true believer. And I know there are true believers even in like the federal department of education and at pretty right. high levels. And I, I don't think it's that far fetched to think that there are people in high places who actively want to destroy these private schools um, from the inside out, we just bring them to their knees to the point where they either cease to exist or where they exist solely in service to the ideology and then sending people on to the Ivies to become the leaders of tomorrow, pushing the ideology on us through law, the force of law, because these kids are going to grow up. They are from the, you know, the, the families and so forth that are going to send most likely the Harvards and the Yales and the so forth. And we see what's going on at Yale Law School. And then those people are the ones coming out and running for office and getting elected. And I mean, there could be that incentive. But regardless, the point is any politician who's telling you that private school is you're out either is ignorant, has no idea what they're talking about, isn't paying any attention to the situation or they're in on it. Well, I mean, we keep saying that. It, I mean, I love Charlie Kirk so much, but he keeps on saying like, go to private, go to private. And I mean, Amy and I yes. keep screaming like, no, it's worse. I mean, it, it is worse. I mean, in light of the fact that no free speech, they sit on these giant endowments, there's no transparency. You don't, you can't ever speak to the board. You can't figure out what's in the curriculum. The teacher, I mean, it is, it's the perfect storm. And I do think they figured it out. I also think that a lot of people are under the false belief that every kid that goes to a private school is wealthy. And that is not true. Yeah, I mean, right. there are lots of, there is a very large socio diverse economic situation well, at private know, schools. For example, at Charleston day, which is, you know, supposedly has a reputation of, you know, a bunch of rich families so they could take their kids anywhere. But however, they filled out um, a federal document for some funds and reported that almost 51% of their um, student population comes from low income families. Mm -hmm. So again, that's simply not the case. Right. So. And also I recall back from um, uh, when, when there was a big push to get rid of the tests for the New York schools, the, the public schools with the tests, you know, the science schools and so forth. And the argument was they're not black enough and so forth. But one of the reasons is that these schools these independent schools send out recruiters and they go to the better middle schools or, you know, those middle schools and they literally recruit from these lower socioeconomic um, neighborhoods. They recruit black students to come to the independent schools, give them full rides and give them all this and promise them they're going to get this great pre-collegiate education. Then when they get them to the school, they lower the standards saying it's racist to have these high standards. Well, it's too hard and this and that. And then they lower the standards. So they're not only the kind of lured them there on false pretenses, even if they're paying for it, but they're not even delivering on the promise. You know, they might even some of them might be in boarding schools. They, they're they not delivering on the promise of this great academic education. They would have perhaps they're also, gotten. They're also not delivering on making them a good human being or helping they claim to build character because we have an example, multiple examples of that exact situation where they have recruited a student or incentivized, or them incentivized with sports something programs. with sports, and then they have come and they have literally committed assault on other students with no repercussions because 
of the fact that they have been given this promise that you are going to come to this school and you are a minority and you're going to get a scholarship and that's what's going to happen. And come hell or high water, no matter how you behave while you're here, that's what we're going to do. So they've and got a golden poor, ticket. Yeah. And the poor mm -hmm. other kids who are the victim of that, those situations. What about them? What about them? Don't all, shouldn't all shouldn't kids every, matter? Doesn't every kid matter? I mean, that's the whole thing. Every kid matters. Every kid. And I think it was one of your videos, Paul, that pointed out, I mean, even now in some of these conferences, like the word goal it is, is, is wrong. They should not capitalistic. be capitalistic. Oh. That's a whole other strand to this is that, you know, and Kendi is the best sort of example of this, that, ca that racism is capitalism and capitalism is racism. Um, you know, what you're saying about this being terrible for the very kids that they claim to be doing this for um, is absolutely true. And I saw it. So they're putting in place before the children's identities are really formed and they've learned how to build their self-reliance and emotional self-control and self-regulation. They're putting in essentially problems that you experience. It's because of other people. All you, people are holding you back and like it's on them to create a place where you can thrive. Your thriving is dependent on, um, you know, whiteness or, or white supremacy, uh, you know, in, interrogating their own biases, which is the worst message you could possibly send. Other people and, have to change for you to be successful and happy is right. an abuse, an abuse tactic. I mean, all of this is, is in, is, is verbal abuse, all of it. You're, 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 you're externalizing all the person's personal power and handing it to other people. They're putting new shackles on them. There's nothing liberating about that message. And to me, it's so obvious. Like, I mean, you know, once you kind of break it down, like Paul just has, it's like, how do people not see that? But that all they have to do is have their role their you know, wear their little authority costume, whether it's I'm the headmaster, I'm the head of NIS, I'm a head of a DEI training, I'm a head of whatever. And people, we have a very strange fetish, I think, in this country with credentials. There's certain kinds of credentials that people look at and it, it it's sort of like almost brainwashes you out of your sense of logic. The things that are coming out of their mouth make no sense at all. Be like, but they are the expert or they must know. And you're like, no, I'm sorry. I don't care what white lab coat you put on. I don't care how many letters you have after your name. Um, that doesn't change reality. And, and there are certain things that are just provably true. And telling somebody that your success depends on other people is a bad message. Like we've known this for hundreds of years. Um, I wanted to, you, you, um, there's something about NAS too, Paul, that I wanted to get to, which is that the way they choose the DEI trainings is very specific, isn't it? They have specific criteria, I believe, for what the D – because obviously they're theoretically different ways of doing it, right? And they have a specific way of, of choosing. Isn't that true? Uh, well, I mean, if you were to say have some alternative DEI program that was not based in CRT, like if you were Chloe Valdery or Dr. Sheena Mason or any of these other, you know, emerging, I think, healthier alternatives, um, really, it would be who you know. So they would, you know, they would surround the offender and expel them. So if you don't, if you're not aligned with the quote unquote scholarship from the, from these experts that are part of this ecosystem, mm -hmm. which have all the right ideas, people like Brie Picower, people like Bettina L. Love, people like Goldie Mohammed. These are the, these are sort of the, the, the second tier, middle tier layer of scholars, which translate right. the abstruse intellectual part of critical social right. justice down into the practical. So they, you know, if you're not aligned with what they're putting out, forget it. You're just, you so are anti-capitalism, you know, anti-white, you know, anti all that. Well, that okay. was something like for the MLK. I mean, when we said that we wanted to confront concerns with good ideas, like Chloe Valdery. I mean, she's a great example of professing agape love. And I, I mean, that would have been a, a much healthier and more productive conversation. I believe also if you had let the parents know what was going on, that could have also facilitated conversations. Um, mm -hmm. 
one thing that I wanted to say from what Paul was uh, speaking to earlier, you know, in the situation with the kids where that, that accountability piece is missing, you know, one year there was an assault and because it wasn't dealt with correctly, I believe that's why the very next year we had another, you know, student on student assault. And yet the police aren't called by the school to, you know, to report uh, this sort of thing, yet they're called and their resources are wasted because, you know, Andrea and I went on a podcast and uh, police is called for that, all on top of us receiving defund the police messages from our school. Um, you know, but that's it, all because, again, with NAIS, all disciplinary matters, all disciplinary matters are only only handled by the headmaster. I mean, the board doesn't even know what's happening. So, so she's basically the dictator of the school. I mean, there's no, there's really no other way to put it. This person is a totalitarian dictator of the school. Anything she says goes, no matter how unreasonable, all discipline goes through one person. There's not, it, there's not even a, a panel. I mean, even when I went to prep school, there was a panel of people handling discipline and it was a rotating panel. So nobody could ever get really entrenched. And it was made up of the teachers, it was made up of, uh, you know, I think it was the assistant headmaster. It wasn't even the headmaster. Headmaster was mostly out raising money. And, but it was rotating membership so that you wouldn't get some power hungry person, right? They, they, it's almost like jury duty, like people serve their time on this disciplinary panel. And as I recall, thinking back to people I knew who got disciplined, people weren't afraid to go before the disciplinary panel because they felt like it was fair. I mean, you'd get some people got kicked out, but the point is you felt like this was more like what we Americans would call due process. Right. And but the person who was going questions when we, when we that we had expelled. about that as well. But when we got expelled, I mean, right. talk about due process. We asked for a copy of the contract and we asked for an appeal and they told us we are not entitled to either of those, those, those things. Nor so will they provide nothing. And we got no warning. I mean, there was no warning. Actually our, the head of our board gave Amy and I written permission via email, via email to speak to any person or any third party about the school or its leadership at any time. And that's before we went and spoke to, to, anybody. Any, to anybody. And the only reason we ever did is because weeks and weeks had gone You're by silenced and they were and, just stonewalling us. And you just have a lot of questions. And as the time goes by, again, it, it appeared to be a two tiered justice system for discipline at our school. So we had more and more questions and, you know, there's, do you feel now like they set you up with that? Well, it's, I mean, again, you know, there was another group that came to our board that same year and they are what were called mosaic and they are the black group of families at our school. And you are only allowed to be in that group if you are black. It didn't used to be like that, but it is like that now. And they came to the school. And I mean, I guess some parents that are by racial yeah, couples okay, are but, in, but yeah, pretty much. I would not yeah. be allowed in it. Um, and so what happened was, is one of the board members um, actually told um, myself, Amy, that they had come to the school with 30 demands and demands was the word that he, he used of the school. And this is like right after George Floyd. And so right after that happened, um, all of a sudden, like 50% of every faculty meeting had to be discussing race, no matter what class, no matter what, which our teachers tell us that bled into like 100%, if not 90% of every faculty meeting. So you're not discussing academics at all, all anymore. This is all you're talking about. Um, all the faculty um, professional development changed. Um, lots of the curriculum changed. Um, and we didn't understand. And, and these were 30 demands that were the most important things to a, a very large part of our community. Why wouldn't they want to share them with everybody so yeah, we like, could all be aware? Right. Why wouldn't we want to solve and, them as a community? And we wanted to ask, like, well, did you meet all the demands? And if not, why not? But we weren't even allowed to know about that. So the thing is, though, is that nobody ever knew that that group came forward because the board did not decide to burn them down to the ground like they did Amy and I. We came with questions and they treated us completely differently. So again, it is a two-tiered system of how they deal with people. I mean, just depends who you are and what what, what your skin color what is. What skin color? Or I was going to say it sounds not just yeah. two-tiered. It sounds literally segregated. Uh, you know, um, I want to I want to add here because this is moral intimidation. This is how it proceeds. So they use moral intimidation. They use the language of moral intimidation from 
um, radical, you know, 60s movements, essentially demands. Uh, but I don't think it is ultimately about race, because if you are a person with dark skin and you don't align with the ideology, you're not right. welcome either. Right. Um, so this is, about, uh, this is about ideas and <laughs> a kind of uh, moral framework that, that have been put in place where people are being intimidated into joining it. Uh, they, I mean, I've watched training sessions where they explicitly tell um, social justice aligned black educators how to keep their skin folk who aren't kin folk out of their conversations. So, you know, they'll say, you know, if a person who's a black and brown comes to your session, but they're not aligned with what we're talking about, you know, they got to get to step in. Like they literally talk about excluding people who don't conform to those ideas. So, and at this, at, by the same token, if you're a white person, of course, you're always going to be white supremacist. Uh, you know, and you're constantly interrogating your biases. But if you know that and you ha have acknowledged that, then you're gained access as an ally and co-conspirator and all the rest of it. So, uh, you know, the, the race is the actual, you know, race or skin color or whatever colorism is is not really the differentiator here. It's used when it's pragmatic to get to for that moral intimidation, mm -hmm. but it's not exclusive. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, but it sure does feel like that at times, you know, because unless you are raising your voice. So if, if you fall into that vast middle group of parents or teachers or anybody who isn't comfortable, doesn't have that, you know, the gumption that Andrew and Amy have to say, you know, like, oh, yeah, I'm with them and I'm going to do that. But by the same token, you're not joining in on the DEI thing. You're presumed to be with Andrew and Amy if you're white. Like you said, you know, you're it's it's already the presumption. You're not walking around clean. No, yeah, you're guilty until you're proven it. Not exactly. innocent even, but just proven, you know, right. that you know you're guilty. That's and a, the that's same the thing goes <laughs> and the same thing goes for whether you know, the so-called black and brown parents and teachers and so forth. You're presumed innocent until you prove that you're guilty. Like if you gave any aid and comfort to Andrew and Amy or those ideas, you'd be out the same as they are, but you're presumed innocent you're given that so that's i think what you guys mean by the two tier is there's a cost to remaining silent that is a i mean not silent but there's a, certainly a bigger cost to speaking up you know for the for the people who speak up but for those who stay silent there's a bigger cost for people who look like you because your kids are still going to be treated like second class citizens no matter what Right. I mean, my daughter, my husband's Mexican. My daughter's a Latina. They uh, they published like a nine page United Against Racism document uh, for our school. I mean, we went and, you know, I, we tried to we were all in, you know, we went to this the football field for this event uh, where people were airing their grievances about the racism at our school. This nine page document was published. All the Latinos were not mentioned once. We had our Chinese group of parents asking about, you know, because of it being called the China virus, they were worried about their kids being bullied. They had, had an incident, reached out to the director of diversity if perhaps they could have like a conversation or something with the kids. We're never even called back. So, you know, you're right. It's um, it's it's like a BLM, you know, kind of thing. But I think that's, you know, to Paul's point is because ultimately it's about ideology. Mm -hmm. And the ideology is, I think, you know, conveniently slash cynically using the visible race, you know, like the really visible, like a super obvious, I don't need to know your name or whatever, um, to as as a as just kind of a, um, a shorthand, you know, like an easy way to, to do it. And also because um, it, it's historically been an easier way to kind of get a bunch of people to to feel you know, like you said, that moral, that moral, um, bullying or whatever, uh, intimidation, I the think moral Paul, intimidation. yeah, with Paul saying that, I mean, for instance, upon belief and in information, we had, you know, there were teachers putting out letters, um, you know, one just came to our attention about, you know, a teacher sent something out to the whole faculty. Um, however, we had a parent, um, 
imitate a teacher and write a letter, uh, I believe, saying that we were threatening or we should be legally removed from, from the community, the campus. that we're, we're radicals. Um, and, and it was a parent writing it, not a teacher, a parent posing as a teacher. Again, trying to bully, intimidate, threaten, um, you know, and you're wondering about the safety of your children. And then you're hearing that, you know, an assault has happened and we don't even call the police on that. And nobody's notified that this is going on. And yet the information was only leaked to my daughter's teacher at first. So, you know, we're asking, are, the, are our kids OK? And they don't even respond to us. I mean, the teacher who who the ethics teacher who wrote this nasty letter saying, you the know, ethics teacher. As we dance on the lawn and he tends to our children, I hate to tell him, but it's a job and he's getting paid for it. So, I mean, you know, whatever, keep that in right. consideration. But And also it's as like, whose children are they? just to shreds. These are our children. These are not your children. Well, right. And, and, and you know, this teacher at the time. So you can imagine, you know, how. I can't imagine. Actually. Now that we look back her. that this letter <laughs> went out and, you know, what was going on, you know, to make her feel you know, this is, this is, uh, this is straight from the NAIS in their handbook for the administration. They say, you have to realize, you know, administrators that you are the senior partner in the relationship with the child with respect to their education at your school, that the parents are the secondary partner. Like they are not part of these. They are not part of this. It's right there in black and white. You can read it. It's in a book called hopes and fears. So, you know, th this carving out of intimacy, which they arrogate into themselves because they're the trusted brand and the parents put their faith in us. And therefore they, they have this noble mission. And whenever you have a noble mission, start looking for how they're gonna screw you because that's- That was, in the, yeah. that was in the letter, Paul, sacred mm -hmm. trust. Sacred trust, the, the right. teacher, The teacher, the ethics and character coordinator wrote, um, this sacred trust is placed in us, I believe. It was how he worded it. They sanctify it, right? So that anyone who, and if you question the sanctification, well, then you are a desecrator. It's this language, this this language of it's religious like language, religion. essentially. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which is what cults use, frankly. This is the well, same they thing. I was talking about this the other day um, because one of my locals members said it's got all the, the attributes of Gnosticism because they also have this secret knowledge. They're the, they, they're the, the ones, the guardians of the secret knowledge, and they're going to give that to your kids. And then your kids are going to go on. And of course, nobody stops and says, well, why do I want my kids to have knowledge? I don't have, you know, like, why do I want my kids to go into this inner sanctum where they're going to learn like secret things that are going to you know, like the secret technology, these words, the yeah. word salad. That they're well, gonna you're just an old parent. College. You don't know how to use the VCR. You know, that's for the kids to figure it. Like that's going to help them. In why would this school validate that? That's like the opposite when I went to school, it was how they were going to turn me into a functioning adult. In other words, how I was going to learn respect for adults, how I was going to learn to become an adult that people would respect, that I would have it's earned it. Citizen. Right, well, this and is, all this of those things. Because, yeah, they own the culture. So they're looking at this with a long-term view. Like, these people are going to be in positions of power, and it's just a secret language, right? It's a ship. These are shibboleths that all the kids have to know how to talk to each other. And we control this. This is vertically integrated. So this is why this is not about, this is not a libertarian market problem. This is a cultural problem and it spans private, it spans public, it's right. everywhere. And so, you know, going I'm back really to what you were saying. I'm really glad you said that because I've been saying for, for months, right? There, there's not a political solution to this problem. This is a mm -hmm. cultural problem and that Americans, um, first of all, need to not hold the word American in their mouth like they're eating poop. They need to say it proudly. And they need to remember, we need to remember that we're only going to keep like our Bill of Rights and, you know, all, all of the, you know, individualism, our values, the, the liberal values, right? That, we, you know, that we, we all thought whether whichever party you were in, most Americans, certainly if you went to another country that didn't have freedom of speech and didn't have the right to defend themselves, it didn't have things we have, most Americans would suddenly be liberal. Like we'd all, we'd all be like, wait a minute, I have rights. And we're not, you don't, that's not automatic. You have to pass that to the next generation. Ronald Reagan famously said that, right? We're only one generation away at any given time. And that means it has to be taught. So if you have people actively teaching kids that that's bad, you're not going to have America. You're not going to have all these things. They aren't just going to stick around with different people in charge. You're going to have what happened to Andrea and Amy 
on a national scale. You're going to have the government be the headmaster saying, we own your kids now, step aside. What's well, already our happening? Chinese, our Chinese parents said this is like, um, they said, for as frightened as you are, <laughs> we're 100 times more frightened because this is so reminiscent of Mao's China. And, right. to, you know, that you toe the line. But it's right. so happening still again, as we said in the beginning, it's like, well, why would people be paying for this? Why would you allow this to be happening? How could you just sit back and watch it? It's happening, though, because, again, the goal is to create divide, I believe, between the student and the parent. And the kids don't come home and like necessarily like give you all the details on this stuff. I mean, even the things that we have, you know, in working, you know, with the thousands of undercover parents across the country. I mean, you have to dig for a lot of this stuff. I mean, it's they make it purposely not easy to see. It's very much secretly interwoven and it is obvious when you're like looking for it and really digging but if you're sitting back and you're a busy mom or a dad like I have a friend um, who went to um, academy and has four kids there now it's very very bright um, and literally like doesn't see it and I just said but do you see over the past eight years the mission statement the motto the contracts um the curriculum, everything has changed. And well, she's and like, had, oh my gosh, you're right. <laughs> I've had so many parents say to me like, oh, because I mean, I would be at the school for like six hours or, you know, volunteering, making billboards, you know, doing uh, our bulletin boards, doing whatever I could to help the teachers. And I had so many people say, oh my gosh, I can't believe they did this to you. You know, you were always at the school. I'm so surprised. And I said, well, thank goodness I was always at the school. Because and because of being in like a parents, an affinity group, which I thought was a great thing because I didn't understand. I thought, oh, this is great. We're sharing culture with everybody. But I didn't realize what the mission was there. That's yes. how I saw a lot of these things. And I said, if I hadn't been there, I probably would have just dropped my kid off, and picked them up a carpool line and thought, you know, everything's great. Yeah. You know, you want to do the best for your child. And I thought this school was it. Right. And then, you know, what's your other option? So exactly. if, you know, if you have your kids in the private school, let's say, because, you know, like Charlie was recommending, because the the public school is just as bad, like, where are you going to go now? And I mean, that's when I say things like, you know, try, try to homeschool, start micro schools, all that. But the point is, you have to first know what's happening. You have to really understand and like internalize that you can't fix it because your initial impulse is, well, let's try to fix it. Like you said, let's go with better ideas. Mm -hmm. Let's try to help. There was a family here at Charlotte Latin school that did that. They got 60 families oh, together. Goodness. I don't know if you've seen that story. I, they, mm -hmm. They've got 60 families. together. They put together the most professional presentation I've ever seen. It was gorgeous. Not to mention it was really positive and it included, you know, all kinds of suggestions for how to work in healthy DEI. I mean, it was really quite, it was really quite extraordinary how much time and money and effort they put into it. And the response, the foaming at the mouth, anger, and the like escorting these poor little children to their lockers and cleaning them out and dumping them on the sidewalk without so much as a buy or leave was absolutely barbaric. Well, they and, can't show something a better option because that's an option right. that people are going to be like, I can get behind that. And as you know, we got hundreds of people behind us. I mean, we cannot allow this to happen because we're giving common sense and asking common sense questions. And the more things that you will not answer just leads you to think, what are why you hiding? <laughs> why are you hiding? If everything's so right. great, like, why? Like, what is so hard about saying, what books are you reading to our third graders? I mean, that's just how simple the questions are. Right. So how that's why people think grader? there has to be an ulterior motive. They get, there no more, no more leeway for like, well, they just don't realize how wrong they are. No, they, they believe this. This is an agenda to, I mean, put a fine point on it, you know, take over. But and they also try to mobilize in our case, they try to mobilize their other believers um, to be as nasty as possible. So say Bullying. for example, they took out a full page ad in the, in the, our um, paper 
um, and had all these people sign. And it was like in a way that like if you had a family member of five, it wouldn't just say the so and so family. They had to list like every single person, even if the kid was like a toddler who couldn't even sign their own name if they could it wanted to um, oh just to God. make sure everybody knew how much they hated Amy and I, and they wanted to make sure they knew they were glad they kicked our kids out. I mean, that is the vitriol level that they will want to get. They have these, it's again, it's just like a, it's a mob mentality. It's like it, they get their group and they are going to bully the people that are asking questions into submission and they will try and to a, destroy you. And upon belief in information, it's the school. Well, you know, they don't want to be the ones behind, like we're putting out this ad about ourselves, but this is a really great idea for a parent to spearhead, you know, and be in charge of this. Oh but, yeah. They have all their operatives so, so they can. Yeah, which hands which in the it. end, at least we, I mean, I'm glad you put it out there. We're clear where you stand. We know, you know, I mean, the, the funny thing is, they said, Amy, they keep saying, Amy and I went on a campaign um, against them. We have no social media. I mean, you guys both know from just interacting with us, Lydia. Just have, trying to figure zero, out Chrome to zero, get on zero here. technology skills. Like I'm going to help you with that. Uh, we'll say after the call. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, like, you know, basically, you know, they said that we, but, but when we look at it, say, for example, oh, they also said that we, um, we, they accused us of felony. Oh yeah. They accused us of hack hacking Twitter. the Twitter account. Now we couldn't figure out how to get Chrome on here to get this up and going. But y'all are Twitter hackers. But we can hack Twitter, the Twitter. And our school's email account. Yeah. <laughs> which are two felonies, which they published to the whole school. But that being said, it's like, you know, they, they, they basically, um, just want to do anything and to make you feel bullied and intimidated, predatory alienation. You are alone. Nobody likes, but you, why they say kids. we were doing this campaign, which we were doing complete grassroots. We have nothing. Right. They spent how much in advertising last year? Oh my gosh. Like I don't the know. spent school, I think over three years, or maybe it was Dalton in, in New York over the past three years has spent like $0 in advertising. I think Columbus Academy has spent like over a million dollars in the past several years. On, so, I mean, yet they anybody was 10, on a campaign. Yeah. And again, and even if you did, I mean, that's the thing is like, you know, we, we got to go back to the fact that they've, they've decided that because you have children at the school that you don't have the right to speak outside the school, even like, it's not just at the school to their teachers because of teacher safety or whatever. No, it's like, they're telling you how to behave in your own private life. And, and, and that's, how far does that go? Because it's right. the parents. Now the parents don't have it. So how but, about the grandparents? But the new contracts say that like anybody you're affiliated with, which like, who could that be? Like your fifth cousin could say something, you know, and then your kid gets kicked out. Right. I mean, that's and, and so what I want, what I want the audience to understand is that there is no, I, I'm just going to keep saying it. There's no political solution because there is what, what, what they use against us is that you couldn't elect somebody who says, I'm going to crack down on these private schools or even on the public schools for that matter. We're going to, we're going to come in and we're going to take over this. First of all, in a couple of years, that person would be replaced. Possibly they vote in somebody else. And now that can't, that goes away. Or even if it's six years, that goes away. So the, 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 that's not going to work. Not to mention, do you really respond to this kind of totalitarian action with other totalitarian action? So the remedy, they win anyway. So it, you know what I mean? It's like, if the goal is that you lose control, that you parents aren't the stakeholders, that your children are not individuals, that they're cogs in a giant collectivist machine. And the only, and you start coming up with like, let's have a remedy where somebody comes in with a strong arm and laws and this and that they probably go fine. That's fine. You're still not in charge. You're still dependent now on a different authority to do it for you. And you better hope you please that authority because if you fail to please them and they turn against you, now they are putting something else on you, some other ideology. So the, the people who just want power and control win no matter what you do, if you choose the legislative option, you know, that's why bans on CRT aren't going to work. So to me, the only way is to not play the game. You know, like unless they're going to literally come to our doors and t with with soldiers and march our little children off to their state building, which I mean, could happen. But it, it's it, unless that's happening, we still have one measure of control is to not go. And I know that's like a really, really hard thing for a lot of parents to swallow right now is like, but I have all this investment and all this. And I get it. And it's excruciatingly painful. But that aside, I mean, like that's not going to change. 
So what, I mean, what do you guys think? Like what other options do parents have other than to, to walk away? Like you said, team parent band together with other parents, create your own solutions, form your own little schools where you are the stakeholders. Don't ever, ever hire outside consultants. Like, I don't know. What do you guys think? What's, what's the answer? I have a thought. You know, one thing I've been doing um, just briefly is I've been talking to a lot of wonderful people that are starting classical schools, new private schools that are based on a completely different model. And one of the things they've asked me is, well, what do we do about our DEI policy? You know, because they're going to come after us because they're going to say we're racist. And I was like, who's don't... they? Exactly. <laughs> For her, who's they? But also don't use any of their words. All of exactly. these words, these Gnostic uh, words like diversity, equity, inclusion, don't try to play. If you play with on their field, you will lose because they own that frame. They have all the quote unquote expertise and credentials about, they know what all that stuff means under the hood. What you can do is you can say, look, all we value character over identity because yes. identity is, that is the engine of all the pretty words. That's the root of the tree. And so you have to go underneath what they're saying and say, look, everyone knows what's going on with you, with these people. They value identity over character. The things that make, and your child strong are their individual moral choices. We, we want to make stronger kids. We want to make kids that are, you know, skilled and, and, and we want to arm them, not empower them, but arm them with what they need to right. be good citizens. And then you can, you can build everything on top of that. And you don't even have to explain yourself or use any of their language because it's all crap. And they will win if you try to play that. That's why I'm against anything that says, oh, alternative DEI. No, those words are dead. Everyone knows what it means. They know what it means better than you. Don't even try. Same well, with SEL. Same with all of it. We agree with the classical education. I mean, we homeschool and people <coughs> think, well, I work and have a job, but there's a lot of people that come together as co-ops that, that do different, um, you know, there are some Christian schools. I mean, certainly the Episcopalian and um, what are the other, the other school that seems to be going the DEI awesome. route? Pro no, what is it? Presbyterian? Paul, do you? Oh, Presbyterian. Yeah. Presbyterian. The Catholic schools, schools, too. You have to be careful. Oh, yeah. The Catholic. Mm -hmm. I mean, that yeah. was one of the first lawsuits in Missouri. Um, what was I going to say? What was it? Oh, about the classical. It's about learning, character, faith, and freedom. It, and content. Know, yeah, and we don't. Content. Have to do <laughs> They're not do teaching laughter. content anymore. <laughs> I mean, classical and education. There are some Christian schools. Um, Hillsdale, I also think have some K through 12 programs. Yep. There's online programs offered. Um, there's more and more people out there that are homeschooling. I mean, Charlie Kirk, I remember hearing in the summer of 2020, he was saying, pull your kids from the school. And I was like, my goodness, Charlie's getting very like, like aggressive about this. I think that's a little like knee jerk reaction. And within one year by the next summer, it was like, well, okay, <laughs> here, we here we are. I guess we're going to be homeschooling. So, right. and you know what it, it um, you know, it's a, it's a curriculum that I think that children will benefit from. Mm -hmm. Right. And at a, at a, at a minimum, you're, you know, there are two sides to it. On the one hand, yo, you're protecting them from this noxious, ideology that is anti, I think it's anti-human. I think it's anti-human and anti-reality. And that's, you know, and then of course, on top of that, it's anti-American, but it, you're also giving them a gift. You're giving them access to the education you, you hoped they would get in the first place. You, you were really originally planning to give them, but you were foiled by these other adults who are acting like toddlers and, you know, uh, that's our job as a parent, right? I mean, we're, we, we're, we wouldn't think twice about pulling our kids from an environment where somebody said they were going to feed our kids and yet they were feeding them like mac and cheese and chicken nuggets every single meal. We wouldn't think twice about it. We'd be like, that is not nutrition. I, I got I to get you out of there and feed you some vegetables and some healthy stuff. And it's kind of the same thing. It's it. And with all the materials now available, like you said, co-ops and the different materials that they practically hand it to you, like Hillsdale K-12 at home is, is, is a scope and sequence and even reading lists and all kinds of stuff handed to you. Here it is. Just follow. So you don't have to be a teacher per se. You can just 
find avail yourself of teachers that are out there and not in these schools or and use these materials. And it, I think people don't realize how much easier it is to do than it is to do battle with these schools. You guys have had the couple years from hell just trying to get your kids what you've already paid for. And that's been the story for so many parents. They're going to school board meetings, they're doing these things. And I'm like, imagine you spent that took the effort, the time, and the money that all that costs and put it into doing it yourself some kind of way. And not just you alone, but like you and ten, the 10 friends that you went to the school board meeting with or you went to the, the board with or whatever. You know, you get all of you together and say, you know what? Wait a minute. We're smart people. We could do this. Um, and I, I hope more people do. I, I certainly hope people have gotten out of this conversation that simply going out and, you know, second mortgaging your home and putting your kid in an elite private school is not going to solve your problem. Right. It's going to create new problems. Mm -hmm. Um, what, uh, how are your kids? I mean, it's kind of a personal question, but are they okay now? I'm like, how's that going? Well, I think it's still evolving. I mean, yeah. I just think, you know, they're kids and, um, they don't understand. But it had to hurt them tremendously. Oh, I mean, it, well, it hurts all, even hurts all of us. More. Yeah. I mean, I, we were talking before we got on the air and, um, you know, being 16 is a, hard time for anybody in your life. And sure, you know, it's the only place you've ever been since you were four. And, you know, it just, it, it, you know, even my younger one, it, it affects tremendously as well as Amy's younger one. It's just, you know, when you're a teenager though, it's just kind of creates this extra angst in the house of, you know, just, you know, how did this happen? And, you know, the school's right. portrayal of the sense. fact that it was it my fault. To and, them. Yeah. So it creates a lot of ripple effect in our family. Um, but, right. but at the same time, time, the policies and the, and the direction they were going are designed to separate your kids from you also. Mm -hmm. Yes. I mean, it's, yeah. it is an absolute no win rock hard place kind of situation. Um, I really, I really feel for you guys. I, 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 I do think what you did was heroic. I really wish more people had stood by you and stood up with you. Um, <laughs> I think it's, I think they're going to someday, I, well, I would hope, but I don't, maybe some people go through their whole life without a conscience. I have no idea, but I would hope that, you know, maybe when their kids get into college and they come home and they're Marxist revolutionaries who are turning them into the authorities, maybe then they'll go, gosh, I should have joined Andrea and Amy. <laughs> but um, I don't think there's, you don't get out of this clean. There is, this doesn't, this doesn't reach a plateau where you get to not choose a side. At some point, everybody's going to have to choose a side. It's like that old thing. Who was it that said, you know, first they came for the trade unionists and then they came for whatever. Well, it's going to be the same for all of us parents. You know, if you have your child in any kind of an institutional setting, public or private, the day will come, I believe, where you're going to have to make that choice. Might as well prepare now. Listen to Andrea and Amy now. Like if you're in an NIAS school and this and this is like the first you're waking up to it, go check your enrollment contract. Because I could guarantee you it says the same stuff theirs does. It's not going to be any different. And they don't, I, they don't even let you print it out anymore, right? You can't print it out. You have to take screenshots of it. So you don't even get a copy. Like, that's insane. Correct. Take, a, take screenshots. Paul, I think you... Paul's probably <laughs> one of the few people that knows exactly how, uh, what an upheaval this is for your life. You I, mean, know he, I mean, he did Paul the same was, thing to his career. So, yeah, I, mean, I mean, you know, I, I just, you know, I just think, Obviously, Deb, you're you're doing what you can. I mean, I just think together as a team of just all of us doing what we can in our own way, that's just what it's going to take. And right. our kids in our country are worth it. I mean, they are yeah. worth it and they will be lost if we don't right. start right now to take back our kids and our country. <laughs> Absolutely. And as you said, it's team parent. It's not it's not, you know, public school parents versus private school versus homeschool parents. First of all, all of our children are going to associate with all of our children at some, at some point. There's not, you're not going to isolate your life and I only homeschool kids for the rest of my life, you know? And so even though my kids aren't currently in the school, they were. So I've still got to deal with residual baggage of stuff that I'm trying to like deprogram a little bit of that, fill in gaps, all that kind of stuff. And they have friends who go to public school and, and private school for that matter. So they're exposed to it. Social media, entertainment, whatever. Our ki kids are growing up in America. And this stuff is now mainstream. And so parents, whatever method of schooling 
you're choosing for your children, we have to be each other's allies here and recognize that, you know, we're, we're raising the next generation. And if we don't like the, the people who are engaged in, whether it's coaching, teaching, tutoring, administering, all of that, all the way up through college, we, we have to stand by each other for things like protecting parental rights, parental notification of all kinds of things, even for medical practices. And also, um, you know, what gets, what gets done in institutions our kids don't attend because you never know what tomorrow brings, right? I mean, if something happened and I had to, like, I had no choice and I put my youngest in, into the public high school, uh, couldn't homeschool her anymore, I, I got to care about what's going on there, right? So there, it, it, I just think we have to work together. And I really hope that people, um, you know, hear that message and recognize that when they're standing up and talking about what's going on in their school, that they're also speaking for some person on the other side of the country, whether they realize it or not. That's what I think. Anyway, that's what I try to do here on this channel. Well, um, public or private. I mean, undercover mothers is, uh, you know, like we said, hundreds, if not thousands of people across the country. So if you want to send in something that's going on in your school, they are collecting that data and trying to, you know, that's how we're recognizing patterns. Things are going on. Um, right. How can people, how can people send things to you or how can people get involved and join you guys and, in, in your fight or what, what, what can, what can be done? What can, how can people help? Paul, you say what you've got going on. Oh yeah. I just, you know, DM me on Twitter. My DMs are open. Or I'm going to keep them as long as I can and, and okay. send, send me stuff. Uh, Paul okay. D Rossi on Twitter. Um, and then undercover, it's bonjour undercover mother, right? At Proton Mail. Uh, yes. And also on Twitter, I, we don't have Twitter and I'm not sure because that's another like department of, of mothers that <laughs> handles all of that social media stuff. I believe direct DMs are open as well. There's a sub stack that's written. That's another whole department of mothers. They write a sub stack um, with some great information as well. And just sharing, you know, being able to see those patterns like, wow, whether you live on the East Coast or the West Coast or in the heartland like we do, um, we can see that the common factor and threat amongst all of us is the NAIS. And we would have never been aware of that if it wasn't for our headmaster. I mean, she really brought our attention to the NAIS and well, I mean, at least opened our eyes to it. Okay. Yeah. And so, so we, these are the two Twitter, these are the two Twitter accounts for Paul and for undercover mothers. And then oh, your, you. what was the one you said, Paul, for, for the other thing that they should do? Um, if you, I think if you want to join or get connected, yeah. send an email to, is it bonjour undercover mother? At I, guess that's what it is. I know it's proton, proton mail. mail. Paul, and that's, that's all yeah. Know. Bonjour undercover mother at, um, gmail.com what's that gmail gmail yeah sorry i think they have a proton okay there. and then deb um finally amy and i finally um everything is a long road it was a long road to find an attorney uh, but we did and um, we did file a lawsuit against the columbus academy the board of directors and the headmaster of our school um and um like we told you, um, they sit on a very large endowment. They don't pay any taxes and um, they have hired two very large law firms. It's like David and Goliath. Yeah. So <laughs> here we sit, um, but we are um, trying to raise money for our, our lawsuit. Um, if you go to Give, Send, Go and you look up Columbus Academy, um, then you'll be able to see um, just Updates about on our, our case. case. Um, and so anyway, we would just appreciate anybody. That so we look up Columbus Academy. Okay. So I want to put that up there too. Thank you. And you're so welcome because I want you guys to get the support that you need. And, and mostly, like I said, I, I hope, um, so go to give, send, go.com. And I think it's com, and then look up Columbus Academy. Um, I hope if nothing else, we've dispelled the myth that private schools aren't out. So if you're upset with public schools and that, you know, private schools are better, private schools are freer, private schools, all the myths that that people used to have about what they were, they're actually not true. And there may be people out in the audience who are thinking to themselves, you know, well, too bad, so sad or whatever, you know, like there's always that the those kind of people who 
have that envy thing and they thought that, you know, elite pr private schools. But to your point, I want to make sure people understand this. Not everybody who sends their kids to private school is rich. There are a substantial number of people there who scrape and save and mortgage their house and work really, really hard to get their kids um, through these schools um, for a host of really good reasons. And let's be let's be honest, if they were still what they used to be, who amongst us wouldn't wish for our kids to go there? Right. I went to a wonderful prep school and it was always my dream that my kids would go there. I couldn't afford it. But then when I noticed it went woke too, it was heartbreaking for me, even though I don't have any kids there. It's heartbreaking for me for the kids who are there. There are a lot of scholarship kids. You've now got in many of these schools, you can have 60, 70% of kids are getting some financial aid. So, you know, that's another yeah. myth that everybody goes to these schools is rich um, or that the teachers are highly paid. By the way, they're usually paid less oh than public gosh. schools. <laughs> yeah, they're better. Aren't as good. <laughs> teachers, right. They are actually paid a lot less than yeah. public school teachers. Yes. And do and not even have an HR department, cannot no. even get their own professional development. I mean, that yeah. we asked, one of the things we asked for was a confidential, 24 hour confidential reporting line for our teachers and faculty. And it was denied. Right. And what the, the, old reason, I wouldn't say the reason, but a reason that teachers would seek out positions in private schools used to be because you had a higher degree of autonomy, less paperwork. You were teaching at a different level of student and parental involvement and commitment. So those for a lot of professional teachers were perks. That's like, you know what, that offsets the money I'm not making because I'm a truly respected professional and in control of my own classroom and I'm teaching the way I know best and academic content and all this. You're not subject to all the bureaucracy of the public system, but they've taken that away. So okay. all the good, all the, like anything that used to be good about private school has gone by the wayside and now you could argue they're worse. They are actually worse oh, than you have schools. a one year contract. And so if you're not part on board with that ideology, guess what? You're gone. This isn't the right school for you. And for them, it's OK. <laughs> they don't care. We'll keep your money. And at any but at any point in time, you're in a public school. Just get up and leave. You don't even necessarily in many states need to say you're unenrolling. You just need to sign up. To, you need to do whatever the paperwork is to homeschool and just get gone. And, you know, you've lost the tax money, but that's a fraction of what people pay, you know, for, for the private schools. So and even parochial schools, you're looking at five, six thousand dollars a year if you're members of a parish um, and it could be upwards of 10 if you're not. So this is this is not a small thing and not everybody's rich. So I really can't thank you guys enough for taking all this time to come and explain this to us. It is very little discussed and less known um, as far as a problem. And I hope that people, people watching, please, please like this video, share this video, get this out to more people um, so they can learn from this. And hopefully all parents can work together on team parent to fight for our kids and our country because, you know. Not to sound cliche, but that that is the future. <laughs> it's thank you very true. much, Deb. You're Thanks, so Deb. Welcome. Thanks, Deb. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great afternoon, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.